Hi, my name is Guy Wallace, and in this PAC video short, we're going to discuss performance simulations, a key component of the PAC processes for training and development. PAC is an acronym. It stands for Performance-Based, Accelerated, Customer and Stakeholder Driven, Training and Development of Any Blend. Performance simulations are one of the many types of instructional activities that can be produced in the PAC processes in an IED effort or in an MCD effort where you're building an entire typical traditional course, workshop, seminar, learning environment, whatever you want to call it. Key in a simulation exercise are the various roles. I like to organize the roles in a simulation exercise into these four. There's a key role, a support role, an observer role, and the facilitator role. The key role is the target audience representative. If it's a salesperson, that's the key role. If it's the union negotiator, that's the key role. It's whatever performance we're targeting, that's the key role. The support role is somebody who's going to be part of that performance context. Very few times are we doing a simulation exercise where it's a person operating all by themselves. The observer role is there to reflect on what they observed and to provide feedback. In a typical classroom situation where there may be many simulation exercises going on and we want to give people as much hands-on time, we would divide the group into various teams and these four roles would be on these teams where the key role is doing the work, the support role, key role is giving the information, playing the foil to the key role. Then the observer needs to be trained to observe and then give feedback. And then there's a facilitator role what, who might be running many different simultaneous simulation exercises going on within the classroom environment. In this example of a simulation exercise, there are three roles in the simulation with the facilitator off to the side, down on the left-hand side. The red team are the executive decision makers in this scenario, and the green team is the group that's giving the information to the decision makers so that they can make the decision. The blue team are observers. They've all been through the information, they've all been through the demonstration, now it's time for application, and so everybody, theoretically, has been trained to know what the criterion are for task performance and the product to be produced, the decision. So there's a decision making process and then there's the decision. So that's what the blue team is observing, the process and the products so that they can give feedback. Now everybody should be learning while the red team executes the decision making process and comes to a decision. They're learning because they're actually doing the work of course, they need to reflect on that first because just doing it is not going to guarantee any learning. The green team giving information to the red team should be observing as well, playing that part of the role, thinking about what information and demonstration they saw earlier and how this is playing out, how I would do it differently than the red team is doing it, and learning from that. They'll be expected to reflect on all of that at the conclusion during the debriefing of the simulation. But the blue team is holding the criterion list and checking off what they're observing process-wise and what their take is on the product produced. So the simulation is run and the decision is made and then it's time for debriefing. My good friend Tiagi says all learning happens in the debriefing. That's because we're reflecting on, well, what just happened? what could have happened that didn't happen, what happened that should have happened, and what's our takeaways from that. So facilitating the debriefing is something that the blue team in this example might be expected to do. And then if everybody shifts roles and the blue team becomes the red team, the red team becomes the green team, and the green team becomes the blue team, and everybody shifts positions and runs through another scenario, and then gets feedback from the new blue team, and then shifts again so that everybody finally gets a seat in all of these positions, 
It may be the facilitator that conducts the master debriefing after three rounds of the simulation have been run, and everybody gets to reflect on all that they learn in their participation in three rounds of a simulation exercise. If there were several teams running simultaneously, let's just say four, now we have at least 12 people who can talk about their experience and what they learned, what they saw that they liked and would replicate in the future, should that be appropriate, what they saw that they wouldn't do and why and what they would do instead. It's the job of the facilitator to tease all of that out during a structured reflection process, a structured debriefing of the simulation exercise. The simulation exercise is fed by the performance model which captured what performance is required on the job. The simulation exercise should reflect as much of that as possible, but it can be embellished by the enabling knowledge and skills that were captured in the analysis process regarding the policies and procedures, the tools and equipment, the interpersonal skills, etc. There are 17 categories of enabling knowledge and skills. Whatever was captured related to the performance that the simulation is trying to authentically simulate needs to be brought to bear. Not all of it, but the key critical skills, knowledge, that truly enable the performance and are the differentiators. I've been practicing, publishing, and presenting on these methods since 1982. My recent book, Six Pack, covers all of this in great detail.